I did have a melanoma removed from my back in 2010, but it was extremely shallow, like less than a millimetre. Um, so when I started to feel a little ill back in May of 2000, like of last year, um, I just thought I'd picked up a tummy bug. Um, within a couple of days, I was in hospital. Um, my abdomen swelled to the point that I looked like I was in the third trimester of pregnancy because it was filling with fluid. I didn't know what was wrong with me. And they took some tests, did some scans, took a biopsy. And a few days after that came in and said, we're really sorry, but you have stage four metastatic melanoma. There's absolutely nothing we can do for you and you'll probably be dead within a few weeks. They said it to you that bluntly. That oh, absolutely. They were, oh, they were, to be fair, they were calm, but they had a message to deliver. And that was that you had a few weeks to live. Yes. And so that was more than half a year ago. In fact, what, nine months ago, eight months? I'm sorry, months. I went into hospital on Mother's Day, so it was May 10th. I remember it perfectly. And um, as I say, I was given a few weeks after that. And I'd been, I'd been at work. I walked away from work. I left all my stuff on my desk. I never went back. Now, now, the difficult thing about doing these interviews is that you have to tread a fine line between something that sounds like an advertorial, because we're not here to promote this drug, but why are you alive? Why are you alive when you were told that you would be dead months ago? Well, actually, stepping away from the drug for a moment, I'm alive because of my family, because of my husband, and because of his advocacy. Because the people at the public hospital told me there was absolutely nothing they could do for me, but he didn't accept that. So he was the one who sought out information. He was the one who rang the private clinic after being told to by the people at the public hospital. He was the one who, when I was discharged from hospital, threw me in the car and drove me to Auckland, even though I was sick. He was the one who demanded that they test my cancer for the BRAF gene. And he was the one who walked to the oncologist with a check for $12,000 for the drugs. That's why I'm still alive. $12,000 gets you drugs for how long? A month. But we were lucky, you see, because when he went in with that check for $12,000, they told him that that first drug, the gene therapy drug, that we'd actually get in, got in on the Compassionate Consideration Program. Right. Now, this is a beginner's guide. And Jeff, who is sitting beside me for people listening on the radio who can't see this, we're going to talk to you in a moment, Jeff. But I'm going to stick with Lisa because I want to hear your story. This is a beginner's guide. So the first drug you used kind of whacks the cancer but doesn't beat it for good. Is that...? Um, in my case, it whacked the cancer hugely. My family and my friends kept me alive for uh, the time it took for the drug to start working. They rostered themselves on and they fed me once an hour a spoonful of food, which if you could imagine how quickly I got sick, that was all I could take. Um, and within probably a week of taking that drug, I was able to get out of bed. Name the drug for me. Debrafenib. And what do you call it, you two? Because you shorten it, don't you call it? BRAF. BRAF, okay. Mm. Can we call it BRAF from now on because I can't remember how to even say the other thing? Say it again, Lisa. Debrafenib. Okay. So after Debrafenib, you went to Keytruda, and that's what you're on now? Yes, I took Debrafenib for five months. Um, it was a really hard decision to stop taking it and to move on to Keytruda or Pembrolizumab because... Um, because it had worked so well for me, because it had saved me, because it had sent me into full remission, but I knew that it was going to stop working. So hold on a sec, you were told you were going to die, and then you were within, you had full remission. Oh, I was told I was going to die in May, and in August I had a scan and was told that there was no sign of the cancer, that it had, I'd gone into full remission, that it was all gone. And that drug is not publicly funded in New Zealand. There is no publicly funded effective treatment for melanoma in New Zealand. There is no option but to go private if you want to live. The only thing offered by the public hospitals is palliative care. I got a lot of morphine from the public hospital, but no treatment. Jeff, can I come to you? How old are you? 22 years old. And you are in the position that Lisa was describing. It's a blunt conversation to have with a 22-year-old. Of course. But, but you've been told you have stage 4 melanoma, it's metastasized, and you're in real trouble. Yes, of course. And I'm, to give me a fighting chance, I need these drugs to be funded. 
So you are now taking this BRAF as well. Mm -hmm. How are you paying for that? Um, at the moment, I'm fundraising um, on Give a Little. Um, I've been doing it on social media, um, Facebook, Instagram, whatever. Old fashioned, help. old fashioned community stuff. Galas, galas, dinners, also, yeah, yeah, yeah. galas, dinners, yeah, uh, yeah, concerts. And how much does it cost? How much does a course cost? Course cost uh, for for the BRAF, uh, for the BRAFs that I'm on at the moment. It is ten grand every every month. Forgive me, because this is an awful conversation to have with a 22-year-old, but I think it's important that we're upfront about this. Were you told you were terminally ill? or that it I, was They never used the word terminal, but stage four, I knew. That's inoperable. What that meant. Inoperable. They told me I had on, inoperable tumours in my lungs. And then you had this drug, and what are those inoperable tumours in your lungs not, like now? Gone. Within two weeks, they were gone. And Lisa, yours are gone? Yes. And then, so that is an extraordinary short-term blow to your cancer. And then the long-term strategy, you think, is to use Keytruda, right? Yes. But Keytruda is extraordinarily expensive and is also not funded by Pharmac. Correct. And so, Lisa, you are now taking this position down to Wellington to say, hey, fund this drug. That's right, because even though I don't like parting with the money... At least I can afford to pay. At least I'm being treated. But every day I meet people like Jeff who look at me and say, but how are you getting this drug? And I have to say to them, well, I'm paying. How much does it cost you? Um, it's costing us $8,500 every three weeks. Wow. And Jeff, you don't have that, do you? You're 22 year old. <laughs> large Not even family. out of uni yet. <laughs> no, no. And your yeah. wonderful mum, who was sitting through there mm. and who was supporting you, she doesn't have that money. No, no, no. <laughs> if you were in Australia, if we were, if you were exactly the same in every respect, same illness, same man, same everything, and you lived in Brisbane or Sydney or Melbourne or wherever, Toowoomba, would you be having to pay for this drug? No. You'd get it for free. Yes. Canada, Britain, free. Free. So why isn't it funded in New Zealand? Oh, there's only one reason, and it's money. It's funding. Pharmac is not funded to buy these drugs. It's a, it's a political decision. It's a governmental decision. It, it, it's the cake decision, and it's the classic unsentimental cake decision, and that is you have a health budget and you have to cut it up and distribute it and you have to leave some stuff out. Why do you think they shouldn't leave Keytruda out? Because at the moment, melanoma patients are not getting any share of that cake. And we have the highest rate problems. of melanoma in the world. Exactly. I mean, in the past, there was an excuse. There was no treatment. But now there is. That medicine is sitting on the shelf here in New Zealand, and the only people who are allowed to use it or have access to it are the people who can pay for it. Yet we say that we have a public health system, and that's wrong. That's wrong. What, 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 what other treatment is available for you as stage 4 melanoma patients with metastasized cancers? My understanding is uh, that there is chemotherapy that is effective in possibly 3 to 5% of cases. I think maybe 5 to 10, if that... Very low. My understanding is the official figures are a little high, according to the oncologists. Right. And it's old. I mean, it's old. Mm. They don't even use it overseas anymore. So other than chemotherapy and palliative care, morphine, as you said before, Lisa, that's it. And the chemotherapy has been described to me as being more or less palliative anyway. It's, it's not expected to cure people. The oncologists know it doesn't cure people. So, so Jeff, you had how many tumours in your lungs? Four? Four tumours, yeah. And, and you were told they were inoperable? Yes. You took... Say the name of the it. The BRAF. The BRAF. The BRAFNIB, yeah. Yeah, and the tumours are gone. Yes. In order for them to stay gone, you now want to move on to, to Keytruda, right? Yes. Yeah, eventually. And you're going to have to pay for it yourself. Yes. It's ridiculous. <laughs> so what would you say to Pharmac, you two? What would you say to Pharmac, Jeff? I'd say um, you call it a low priority. I want you to try to wear my shoes. See what priority you'll call it then. Lisa? 
I would say that while you're making your commercial decisions, while you're negotiating with those two drug companies, both of whom have competing drugs, to get the best price you can, while you're waiting for the drugs to go to the generic stage, someone is dying every single day. And how do you cost that out? How much is that costing the country? And where does that come in your calculations?